Craddock Knoll, A Tale of the New Forest, Volume 1, Chapter 1, by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Within the New Forest, and not far from its western boundary, as defined by the second perambulation of the good king edward the first stands the old mansion of the knolls the hall of knolhurst not content with mere exemption from all feudal service their estate claims privileges both by grant and custom the benefit of more fall trees in six walks of the forest the right of digging mar the turbary illimitable common of panage and license of drawing Ackermast, pastime even of hawking over some parts of the crown land all these would be catalogued as claims quite indefeasible if the old estates come to the hammer through the events that form my story with many of these privileges the royal commissioners will deal in a spirit of scant courtesy when the knoll influence is lost in the neighbouring boroughs but as yet these claims have not been treated like those of some poor commoners pooh pooh my man don't be preposterous you know as well as i do these gypsy freedoms were only allowed to balance the harm the deer did and if the rights of that ancient family are ever called in question some there are which will require a special act to abolish them for charles the second of merry memory saddened somewhat of late years espied among the maids of honour an uncommonly pretty girl whose name was francis nowell he suddenly remembered what had hitherto quite escaped him how old sir craddock nowell beautiful fanny's father had saved him from a pike thrust during cromwell's crowning mercy in gratitude of course for this he began to pay most warm attentions to the hampshire maiden he propitiated that ancient knight with the only boon he craved craved hitherto all in vain a plenary grant of easements in the neighbourhood of his home soon as the charter had received the royal seal and signature the old gentleman briskly thrust it away in the folds of his velvet mantle then taking the same view of gratitude which his liege and master took home he went without delay to secure his privileges when the king heard of his departure without any kissing of hands he was in no wise disconcerted it was the very thing he had intended but when he heard that lovely fanny was gone in the same old rickety coach even ere he began to whisper and with no leave of the queen his majesty swore his utmost for nearly half an hour then having spent his fury he laughed at the cell as he would have called it if the slang had been invented and turned his royal attention to another of his wife's young maidens Nowelhurst hall looks too respectable for any loose doings of any sort it stands well away from the weeping of trees like virtue shy of sentiment and therefore has all the wealth of foliage shed just where it pleases around it from a rising ground the house has sweet view of all the forest changes and has seen three hundred springs waking glory and three hundred autumns waning spreading away from it wider wider slopes the chase as they call it with great trees stretching paternal arms in the vain attempt to hold it for two months of the twelve when the heather is in blossom all that chase is a glowing reach of amaranth and purple then it fades away to pale orange dim olive and a rusty brown when christmas shudders over it and so throughout young green and russet till the july tint comes back again oftentimes in the fresh spring morning the black cocks heath poults as they call them lift their necks in the livening heather swell their ruffing breasts and crow for their rivals to come and spar with them below the chase the whiskers of the curling wood converge into a giant beard tufted here and there with hues of a varying richness but for the main of it swelling and waving crisping fronding feathering 
coying and darkening here and there until it reached the silver mirror of the spreading sea and the seaman looking upwards from the warship bound for india looking back at his native land for the last of all times it may be over brushwood waves and billows of trees and the long heave of the gorse land now that's the sort of place he says as the distant gables glisten the right sort of berth for our jolly old admiral and me for his butler please god when we flick them crappos as ought to be southwest of the house half a mile away and scattered along the warren the simple village of nowelhurst digests its own ideas in and out the houses stand endwise crosswise skewified anyhow except upside down and some even tending that way it looks like a game of dominoes when the leaves of the table have opened and gape betwixt the players nevertheless it is all good english for none are bitterly poor there in any case of illness they have the great house to help them not proudly but with feeling and more than this they have a parson who leads instead of driving them there are two little shops exceedingly anxious to undersell each other and one mild alehouse conducted strictly upon philosophic principles philosophy under pressure a caviller would call it for the publican knows and so do his customers that if poachers were encouraged there or any uproarious doings permitted except in the week of the old and new year down would come his license board like a flag hauled in at sunset pleasant folk who there do dwell calling their existence life and on the whole enjoying it more than any of us do for as much as they know their neighbours far better than themselves and perceive each cousin's need of trial and console him when he gets it not but we ourselves partake the first and second advantages only we miss the fruition of them by turning our backs on the sufferer nowelhurst village is not on the main road but keeps a straggling companionship with a quiet parish highway which requires much encouragement this little highway does its best to blink the many difficulties or if that may not be to compromise them and establish a pleasant footing upon its devious wandering course from the limington road to ringwood here it goes zig to escape the frown of a heavy browed crest in fursery and then it comes zag when no soul expects it because a little stream has babbled at it it even seems to bob and dip or jump as the case may be for fear of prying into an old oak story or dusting a piece of grassland the hard-hearted traveller who lives express and is bound for the train at ringwood curses too often up hill and down dale the quiet lanes inconsistency what right has any road to do anything but go straight on end to its purpose what decent road stops for a gossip with flowers flowers overhanging the steep ascent or eavesdropping on the rabbit holes and as for the beauty of ferns confound them they shelter the horsefly that horrible forest fly whose tickling no civilized horse can endure even locusts he has heard of as abounding in the new forest and if a swarm of them comes this very hot weather good-bye to him horse and trap newest patterns sweet plaid and chaste things and good-bye to thee thou bustling traveller whether technically so called or otherwise a very good fellow in thy way but not of nature's pattern so countersunk so turned in a lathe so pressed and rolled by steam power and then condensed hydraulically that the extract of flowers upon thy shirt is but as the oil of machinery but we who carry no chronometer need the puff locomotively now he is round the corner let us saunter down this lane beyond the mark oak and the blacksmith's even to the sandy rise whence the hall is seen the rabbits are peeping forth again for the dew is spreading quietude the sun has just finished a good day's work and is off for the western waters over the rounded heads and bosses and then the darker dimples of the many-coloured foliage many-coloured even now with summer's glory fusing it over heads and shoulders and breasts of heaving green floods the lucid amber 
trembling at its own beauty the first acknowledged leniency of the july sun now every moment has its difference having once acknowledged that he may have been too downright in his ride of triumph the sun like every generous nature scatters broadcast his amends over holt and knoll and lee and narrow dingle scooped with shadow where the brook is wimpling and through the breaks of grass and gravel where the heather purples scarcely yet in prime flush and down the tall wood overhanging mossed and lichened green and grey as the grove of druids over through and under all flows pervading sunset then the birds begin discoursing of the thoughts within them thoughts that are all happiness and thrill and swell in utterance through the voice of the thicket birds the mavis the winchats and the warblers comes the tap of the yaffingale the sharp short cry of the honey buzzard above the squirrel's cage and the plaining of the turtle dove but from birds and flowers winding roads and woods and waters where the trout are leaping come we back to the only thing that interests a man much the life the doings and the death of his fellow men from this piece of yellow road where the tree roots twist and wrestle we can see the great old house winking out of countless windows deep with sloping shadows mantling back from the clasp of the forest in a stately sad reserve it looks like a house that can endure and not talk about affliction that could disclose some tales of passion were it not undignified that remembers many a generation and is mildly sorry for them o house of the knolls grey with shadow wrapped in lonely grandeur cold with the dews of evening and the tone of silver nightfall never through twenty generations hast thou known a darker fortune than is gathering now around thee growing through the summer months deepening ere the leaves drop all men we know are born for trial to work to bear to purify but some there are whom god has marked for sorrow from their cradle and strange as it appears to us whose image is inverted almost always these are they who seem to lack no probation the gentle and the large of heart the meek and unpretending yet gifted with the rank of mind that needs no self-assertion trebly vexed in this wayfaring we doubt not they are blessed tenfold in their everlasting equipoise perhaps it was the july evening that made me dream and moralize but now let us gaze from that hill again under the fringe of autumn's gold in the ripeness of october the rabbits are gone to bed much earlier comparatively i mean with the sun's retirement because the dew is getting cold and so has lost its flavour and a nest of young weasels is coming abroad and really makes it unsafe my dear says mrs bunny to her third family to keep our long-standing engagements send cards instead says the timid miss coney i can write them mamma on a polypod now though the rabbits shirk their duty we can see the congregation returning down the village from the church which is over the bridge towards limington and seems set aside to meditate in straggling groups as gossip lumps them or the afternoon sermon disposes home they straggle wondering whether the girl has kept the fire up kept the fire blissy as the bodily form of the house thought but all the experienced matrons of the village have got together and two who have served as monthly nurses are ready to pull side hair out there is nothing like science for setting people hard by the ears and the throat strings but we who are up in the forest here can catch no buzz of voices nor even gather the point of dispute while they hurry on to recount their arguments and triumph over the virile mind which of course knows nothing about it the question is when lady noel will give an heir to the name the house the village the estates worth fifty thousand a year an heir long time expected hoped for in vain through six long years now reasonably looked for all the matrons have settled that it must be on a sunday everybody knows that sunday is the day for all grand ceremonies even nanny gammon's pigs 
but why pursue their arguments the taste of the present age is so wonderfully nice and delicate i can only say that the gammas who snubbed the gaffers upon the subject miscarried by a fortnight though right enough hebdomadally they all fixed it for that day fortnight but it was done while they were predicting and not even the monthly nurses anticipated no one ever guessed of the contingency of twins End of Craddock Knoll, A Tale of the New Forest, Volume 1, Chapter 1